Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. All right. Uh, am I good? Okay. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Learning Photography with Duck. As always, I am your host, Duck. And today is, oh, this side, Photoshop edition. Um, got a few things to cover. Uh, Adobe has released an update. So if you are a subscriber to the Creative Cloud, uh, you probably have noticed there are some little changes that have been done to uh, Photoshop. And I'll go over those changes for you. Uh, one of them, Gloria, you're going to like. So stand, stand tuned for, stay tuned for that. All right, before we get started, of course, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, <clears throat> this past Saturday, uh, uh, Milford Photo had their uh, little walkabout at the Beardsley Zoo um, in, in corroboration with Sigma lenses. Sigma had a bunch of lenses there that people can test out. And we had a pretty good turnout. I got to say we had about... 35 uh, ish people turn out uh, and it was a great day to be out at the zoo uh, hopefully you've gotten a chance to see some of the images that I've posted on Facebook uh, <clears throat> as far as um, upcoming activities of course later this month is the uh, annual uh, CTPPA um, uh, convention uh, we got a bunch of speakers, uh, so if you're interested in uh, either checking out what PPA is about or even our local chapter, CTPPA, um, it's, this is a great way to meet uh, other members of CTPPA uh, as well as uh, attend some of the workshops that are being presented. So um if you have a, if you're interested in going you got to register through ctppa.com um <clears throat> just look for uh convention all right um coming up next month i uh, i'm going to be doing my annual multiplicity photo shoot Jack, you are on mute i am a mute I was on mute this whole time and nobody told me. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. I, I, just I said I can't hear you. I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> all right. I don't know what's going on? All right. So we're all clueless. Let's start again. <laughs> uh, welcome once again to Duck's Clueless Club. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's way too funny <laughs> hey, hey, I, I, I know what you said you actually said you will give a, a free copy for a year of uh, creative cloud to the first person who answers a question and seeing that none of us answered the question you don't have to give away the prize hey, yep you're so right hey you know i don't write the rules technical uh difficulties aside anyway <laughs> now that you can hear me you know what's going to be funny though is you guys at home couldn't hear me but in the recording everybody can hear me oh. so when you watch the recording back you'll be able to hear what i said except now i got to repeat it for you guys so welcome once again to another edition of uh learning photography with duck as always i am your sometimes silent host <laughs> I, I got a feeling i'm not going to live this one down all right coming up uh yeah i know coming up we got the annual uh ctppa conference uh if you're interested in attending go ahead and sign up through ctppa.com um there's still plenty of uh, uh spaces available uh it's a three-day weekend I'll be presenting on Friday evening. Um, and so if you're interested in finding out a little bit about PPA, which is the Professional Photographers of America, um, or Professional Photographers Association, I can could, I could never keep it straight. Uh, 
you know, this is a great opportunity. Of course, uh, this is the local Connecticut uh, PPA that's hosting this convention. It's not it's not the national convention, but you're welcome to come and, and check it out. You know, uh, we got plenty of members that are more than happy to fill you in as to what we do. Uh, it's a great little fun little uh, organization. Um, anyway, also also coming up uh, the multiplicity photo shoot. Uh, this is something that I've done annually, but unfortunately because of COVID, I haven't done it in the past couple of years. So it's nice to get back into it. Uh, the way it works is you're going to be walking away with a variety of photos that you're going to be able to composite in Photoshop after the fact where and then you're going to uh, create a scene where you're populating the scene with different instances of yourself and it's always been a lot of fun because it gets you to uh, not only work behind the camera but also in front of the camera so you get to experience what it's like to be a model for your photo shoot as well as learn new techniques in photoshop during the assembly so uh, you know, if you can make it, it's a free event. Uh, it's going to be on, what, what is it? Saturday, July 15th at 4 p.m. Okay. And there's, we're, we're kind of tossing around the idea of going up to um, Castle Craig, getting some shots from up there and then coming back down for the actual workshop. We'll see how it goes. Uh, if there's any interest, I'll probably, you know, put out a little poll or something. But anyways, we're going to be meeting at Hubbard Park uh, in Meriden. It's a very picturesque little park. And we're going to be right at the entrance to the park. Uh, there's a little gazebo. There's a little waterfall. There's uh, uh, all kinds of little uh, interesting backgrounds that you can use to create your scene. All right. So that's coming up <clears throat> uh, next month. All right. Um, also in the works for next month is a uh, I sent out a poll a while back uh, asking people if they were interested in a long form workshop on flash photography. Uh, I know a lot of the, the, the workshops that happen in the area. Uh, well, for most of you who are in camera clubs, you know, any kind of workshop that happens when a club is limited to that, you know, half hour, 45 minutes that you have, uh, you know, with the club. So how much learning can you get there? Uh, so people tend to turn to things like, you know, uh, YouTube tutorials, but, you know, it's you can't ask questions, um, you know, so there's a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, and the the majority of the, the workshops that a lot of people do tend to be limited to about two hours. So I sent out a poll saying, hey, would you be interested in a long form, either a half day or a full day event? And the overwhelming response was, yeah, I'd definitely be interested in long form. Not quite the full day, but I'd be happy to do like a half day workshop. So I'm looking at approximately four hours, uh, basically going all the fundamentals of using flash so that you walk away feeling comfortable setting up your own flash for your own work uh, at home, uh, either in your studio or doing portraits or, or whatever it is that, that you want to use your flash for. So. Uh, that's going to be in conjunction with Milford Photo. We don't have a date yet. Uh, we do have a location. There's a building right next to the store that we have access to. So we're going to see about getting that space. It'll probably be on a weekend, though. Okay. Um, all right. And I think that's pretty much it. The Oh, the other one that I, I did not write here is I want to do a, you know, one of my little photo hunts with my, my photo hunt game. Um, that'll probably, uh, I'll see if I can schedule it for next month. Uh, if not in July, uh, maybe in, in August. Okay. Anyway, how's everybody doing? Anybody got any news they want to share? 
No. Am I on mute again? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let me go ahead and load up uh, Photoshop. And all right. So uh, one of the things I mentioned while I was muted was that Photoshop did an update and they made some changes and some additions uh, to Photoshop that, um, yeah, you know, I got mixed feeling about some of the things. Uh, but of course, anytime that you're used to doing something one way and then they change it and it kind of makes you learn how to work work with this new tool you know it, it kind of can seem a little daunting because it's like ah, i was so used to doing it this way now you're giving me this option here that i'm not sure if i want so there's always going to be you know kind of like a a growing pains kind of thing whenever they make any kind of big changes uh Obviously, if the changes are very beneficial and we can see, oh, man, I've been wanting that for years, you're going to jump right into it. But when there's small changes, like what I'm going to go over with you today, uh, you know, a lot of times it's like, ah, why? Why are you even bothering? All right. But I'll give you my my opinion on a couple of things. The first thing you're going to notice is uh, let me come down here. Uh, there is this new content context taskbar contextual text oh I can spit it out contextual taskbar and this kind of floats around typically at the bottom of your image whenever you load up an image it'll it'll populate down at the bottom and as you can see uh, you can move it around and what this is is a little taskbar that is basically going to put um the the more obvious tools that you need for a specific task at your fingertips rather than having to through you know search through either a menu or through the um um, the, your toolbox or your um, adjustment layers or whatever it is. You don't have to hunt for it. Uh, they've decided that, you know, uh, from this state, meaning, all right, I just opened up the, the image. It just loaded in. Uh, I am, as you can see up here, I am in the pick uh, tool. All right. So the options that it's showing me is select subject which is fairly typical action that you would do when you first open up an image or remove background remove background uh, is something new where it's using adobe ai to kind of figure out what is the background and will mask it out uh, and then there are a couple other things here that oh well, this one's grayed out uh and then this one here of course is for your adjustments and this is what i mean by why bother why bother putting that little icon there when most of the time we have the panel open right there with all those adjustments available to us right there not only is it, do we usually well if you don't you should consider oops i i can i can do that you should consider you know uh keeping it in your your oops over there uh, in your tray and if you don't see it just go all the way up to the top where it says oops uh, uh window all right and then uh just look for adjustments and it'll give you that little tab uh panel okay 
So most of the time, that's where I go to whenever I want to generate a new uh, adjustment layer. And of course, you also have it all the way down here in your layers panel. Okay, in your layers panel, there's that little, you'll see the same little um, half black, half white little circle that will allow you to click on that and select from any of these uh, layer adjustments. All right. I will use this whenever I need to get something that is not available in the panel above. For example, a solid color a, uh, adjustment um, is, is not available from the one up top. Uh, so I tend to go there. All right. <clears throat> Why they have it here, I have no idea. For me, it's easier to just go to the panel on the side, but uh, it is what it is, okay? The other thing, if you notice, there is also the um, adjust the your your um, adjustment panel uh, properties, all right? Clicking on this is going to open up the properties panel. Of course, if you click on it again, it doesn't close it. So it's kind of frustrating to use that to access the properties panel because uh, I usually just have it right here and I can just click on it. Oh, and it moves on me. Click on it. And I can toggle it in and out, in and out. I, I, I played with this a little bit, Doug, and I just found it like, like what you said. It's like, yeah, so it doesn't add. To me, it doesn't add anything. To right. The right. The only time I think it, it works is um, when you actually start using it, uh, some of the suggestions that it, it creates actually do fall in line with the workflow. And I feel that at that point, uh, it becomes helpful because rather than having to search through, you know, Photoshop menus and stuff, it's right there on that taskbar. So for example, once you have a subject selected, all right, gives you a few minutes. And of course, uh, with this particular image, it, it kind of failed a little bit simply because it, it selected, you know, some things that I didn't want, but that's easy to fix. We just, you know, uh, we can use whatever tool. Oh, and my tool thing is going crazy again. All right. Why is it going crazy? It's probably because I have something interfering with it. All right. Well, let me close. Let me close Lightroom, just see if that helps. All right, nope. Okay. All right, so we're just gonna do it the old fashioned way. All right, Alt. You know, we can just refine our selection, you know, by using other tools. All right, but once you have a selection, if we look at the content of the taskbar, you'll notice that the icons have changed and these are now suggestions based on the fact that you are in a selection mode, okay? So of course we can uh, refine our uh, selection, all right, we have all these things available. Uh, we can invert our selection, all right, uh, just by clicking it, it'll, so one click we can, you know, reverse uh, what's being selected. Uh, and we can, of course, uh, um, select, you know, uh, our selection in order to to uh, either enlarge the selection or, you know, modify it in one way or another. 
okay so we can manipulate our selection uh this way all right um and of course once once we are in this mode if you notice that the taskbar has now changed where we can flip horizontally or vertically our selection all right um and of course, it keeps defaulting down to the bottom of the image, uh, which can be a little frustrating. I'll show you how to avoid that. OK, uh, and of course, uh, once you have your selection pretty much settled, you can go ahead and make a mask. Or uh, more often than not, once you have a selection, you're going to do something with that selection. And of course, my favorites are the uh, tone curves so of course this is where it comes in handy because now we can you know kind of click on it here oh yeah no never mind i forgot uh, it doesn't open up anything it just it just takes you to your adjustments panel on the side all right so uh again this is like why bother okay um and of course you can do uh uh fills here content aware uh color background foreground etc cetera, etc cetera. okay uh and of course the last one is you can deselect your selection that you created all right now if you're like me i tend to use sh shortcut keys so i don't need the deselect button but um you have to understand that there's there's a bigger plan at play here with adobe that than what we are uh, aware of all right we may look at the contextual bar and say you know what they got some stuff on here that just doesn't make sense all right uh, but you have to understand that this may be first generation in anticipation to changes that are further on down the pipeline. You also have to understand that uh, while we are dealing with the desktop version of Photoshop, there are other uh, alternatives to Photoshop. There's the mobile version, there's the web version, all right? as well as the way people interact with the software. Uh, you may be interacting with the software through a mouse. I interact with it with a uh, stylus and a tablet, okay? However, at home, I interact with it in on a pen display. So I'm writing directly onto my screen with a stylus so a lot of these tools are designed to work effectively with one mode over another and of course there's a lot of machines out there that have touch screens so you can actually instead of using a stylus or a mouse you're actually using your finger to do all your work directly on the screen um, you know either a um, a, a touch screen tablet or I'm sorry, a touchscreen laptop or a tablet. So, you know, we have to kind of assume that Adobe's doing this for a purpose and it's probably to integrate all these different platforms closer to working together uh, a little bit more cohesively. All right. All right. If you don't like the fact that it always floats down to the bottom, uh, you are able to disable that. So if, if you look where it has the three little ellipses, if you click on that, you have the option to hide the bar altogether. If you say, you know what, I don't like it. Uh, it's it just, it gets in my way. I'd rather not deal with it. You have that option. If you later on, you said, you know what, I'm going to give it another try. We can just simply go all the way up to where it's where it says windows all right on your menu and all the way down at almost near the bottom where it says contextual taskbar just click on that and it brings it back okay 
Now, remember I said every time you make a, a new choice of a tool, it's going to change the context of that taskbar. So if I go and pick the magic wand, for example, it's going to change it, but it's also going to float it down to, oh, let, let's try something different. Let's try the, uh, oh, of course it's, it's not doing it when I need it. All right. Oh, because I don't have anything selected. Okay. Proves me wrong. All right, so let's select subject again. All right, so I selected my subject. Uh, the the context of the taskbar changed and it floated it all the way to the bottom. Okay, if you don't want it floating to the bottom, let's say you want to keep it visible up high. All right, you have to move it first. All right, so move it to where you want it. Uh, somewhere on your on your oops somewhere on your uh, on your screen click on the ellipses and click the last one where it says uh, pin bar position pin bar position okay and then once you're there it doesn't matter uh, what you do uh, every time it changes it's not going to float back okay and if you make if you need to change it move it a little bit you can you can move it but it will still be pinned to where you put it all right so that's a nice way of kind of getting around that always dropping down to the bottom uh underneath your image um because that can definitely be frustrating at times okay so that's pretty much the the task bar not much to look forward to here uh, other than possibly making it a little bit more convenient to getting to certain tools when you are in a, in a specific mode. Of course, you know, like you make a selection, uh, it's going to put certain tools available to you. Okay. All right. Deselect. Um, the next one. Uh, is the uh, adjustment presets adjustment presets okay and the uh, yes can I uh, I'll make preferences by saying excuse me <clears throat> I had to run out for a minute when you first started so I don't know if you covered this or are going to but uh, or if I'm asking out of order here I was playing around with just some of these things the other night, and I was surprised when it that uh, I made a, a quick selection and I was doing some, well, I don't know, trying to adjust the, the saturation or something like that. And I had a hard time finding where to do that, but then all of a sudden I noticed it started creating new layers for me as I was. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because this one kind of took me by surprise a little bit, and I'm sure it, it did for you. Um, and again, this is one of those tools that I looked at, and it's like, why? Why? Okay. I, I will mention it first, then I, I'll go into a little discussion, and then I'll show you what the tool is about. All right, but in the adjustments tab, then of course the adjustments tabs is where you have your, all your uh, uh, icons for all your adjustment layers that you can create, such as levels, curves, saturation, vibrance, the whole nine yards, okay? That part you guys should already be familiar with, all right? This part down here with all these little icons, okay? All right, they did make a little bit of a change. They gave you uh, the ability to, you know, put it in a list mode. I think, I think this was available, but you have to go into a menu to change it. Uh, now they just made gave you this kind of like nifty little icon that you can toggle back and forth. All right, so you now have labels. So if you don't know what the icon means. If you're not, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you can just look at the label and say, okay, well, that's my, you know, curves adjustment. That's my levels adjustment. And then, of course, 
uh, as before, when you click on it, it's going to go ahead and create that layer for you. All right. So you guys are already familiar with that. That's nothing new. Okay. What is new is there is another drop down that is available here. And if you can see the individual adjustments is now uh, in a drop down. So you can close that if you want. Okay. I prefer this view. All right. But the other drop down is this adjustments preset. Adjustments preset. And when you first open up, you're going to see some, some uh, adjustment presets. And if you hover over it, you're going to see it's going to temporarily apply that preset so you can preview what that preset does to your image. Okay, now. Uh, well, my problem with that was uh, I accidentally clicked over it and I went, well, I don't want this. And, you know. And yeah. Well, not not from history. Not from right. history. Once something goes into history, it kind of stays in history. History is a, a a thing where you can navigate backwards if you need to to get to a previous state. But I have trouble trying to get away from the adjustment. I can't remember. Yeah. How well, I'll I'll go over it. Don't worry about okay. it. All right. Uh, I just want to kind of explain uh, what presets is in the kind of like the generic term of presets that we're familiar with. Of course, uh, this is a clear example of how we're getting uh, some of the mobile device um, uh, elements being brought into the desktop. If you if you use a cell phone, if you take pictures with a cell phone and you have a little editor, you're familiar with these presets where you just click on it and it changes the overall mood of your image. You can get the black and white, you can get the sepia, you can get the, the color punch, you can get the cinematic, uh, you know, look. Uh, a lot of the times they are very horrific. You really can't do much with them on, you know, the simpler editors. Uh, but you're familiar with that process of these presets, right? Of course, when we go to Lightroom, all right, we can create these presets for ourselves based on uh, some of the, th the edits that we do to our image. You know, we can apply uh, uh, certain exposure changes, certain uh, color changes, uh, cropping. We can do uh, local adjustments using some of the, the uh, AI uh, masking tools. And we can save it as a preset. And then when we come up to another image that kind of sort of fits that mold for that preset, we just click one button and it applies all those changes to our image, effectively cutting down our editing time by a lot, okay? Here's the difference. In Lightroom, we can create our own custom presets. In Photoshop, as of right now, we can't, but I will bet you money that coming down to pipeline, we'll be able to edit some of these presets, okay? So right now, they're kind of generic, all right? <clears throat> and uh, I would suggest spend a little time with them just to see what they do, all right? Because you have to understand that <clears throat> just like the presets in Lightroom, we can apply a certain amount. We can always back that amount off. We can reduce the effect. So if we have something that turns your colors really ghastly, but it's kind of in the neighborhood, we can dial it down. We're able to dial it down, all right? So we can use these presets here kind of as a starting point if you have a hard time visualizing what you want to do with your image, 
use this as a starting point and then back it down okay the other thing is as uh bill mentioned when he was playing around when you click on something all right let's say uh oh well before i click on anything all right you're gonna see that there's only five of them here um and uh it's like well okay there's not much you can do with just five but if you go to the end, you're going to see where it says more. If you click on that, it's going to give you a little drop down of all these different types. So whether you have a portrait or a landscape or you're doing photo repair, uh, this one I, I couldn't make any sense of. Okay, Some creative shots, black and white uh, presets, and of course, the ever popular cinematic presets. All right, so let's say, you know, here in this case, I'm working on a landscape. If I click on landscape, let me, all right, it gives you five variations. And of course, if you hover over them, it's going to allow you to kind of preview what it does. And you can see that it, they're very minor, all right, including going all the way to black and white. So a little bit of color pop, all right. My image was pretty, pretty decently saturated. So I'm not seeing, a, you know, a major shift there, all right. So, okay, so I went through the landscapes. Nothing impressed me. Let's try the cinematic. Oh, this one looks good. What's that? Oh, no, well, that's, that's too, too weird, okay. Let's try this one. Oh, that's definitely way too weird. All right. So play around with them. See which ones. All right. Let's try this one. That's not much. Let's try this one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the cinematic. I'll click on this blue one. All right. Because that's the one that very noticeable change, right? As soon as I click on it, you're going to notice that Actually, let me go ahead and dock this back down. Okay. You're going to notice that it generated a series of layers. And it created a folder that it put these layers into. So everything's nice and compartmentalized for you when you click on that uh, preset. All right, and you can see that in order to get this particular look, what they did was they created a uh, brightness contrast uh, layer and a photo filter layer. Okay, so now you can see what it does and you can see exactly what created it. So you can use this as a learning tool as well uh, if you're not too familiar with some of the tools that photoshop has available all right John? yes uh, yeah uh, what is the purpose of a sub layer or a sub adjustment layer or a sub mask um i've seen people do that i just don't know how it's done or why it would be done um you have you have oh um i'm trying to look at it and it comes to my 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 uh picture instead of yours shut up and see if i can think of it uh and maybe i'll chat it to you yeah i'll uh uh figure out what they mean by sub mask okay, i what i don't I mean by sub is you have that first layer uh that looks like it in, in, in some sort of writings you have a this reminds me of some sort of writings where you have a a subject and then you have a sub layer, a sub subject, and that's indented. Why are some of Oh okay, okay, indented? okay. That's my question. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um and I think I I think I I know what you mean by sub mask and, and I'll maybe I'll 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 show it here. Okay. Um, but for some reason, my, my pen tablet's not behaving properly. Watch on, uh, let me build a new, new layer here. 
Oops, move that up. Uh, get my brush. And yeah, see, my, my for some reason, my, my brush is off. I don't know why. I will try to work around it uh, if, if I need to. Okay, so uh, getting back to what I was saying, uh, the preset creates some layers for you. All right. And the reason these are indented, Bill, is because these two here, all right, are the actual layers. We have the photo filter layer and we have a brightness and contrast layer. Okay. But the reason they're indented is because they reside within a group. All right. And you can see that that's represented by a little folder icon. Now, now I get it. Okay. I thought it was stuck because <laughs> the way we used to have to write things at work for proposals, you had a. Uh, I, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, I, actually, you can think of it in the same exact terms because it resides within that particular container. All right. So if we collapse that container, you can see it kind of cleans things up. And uh, again, you understand that if you have a lot of layers, you want to be diligent about naming your layers. So in this case, this layer is a group layer. All right. Uh, and it contains all the layers that create that cinematic blue mood effect okay now for each one of the layers the actual layers there is also a mask attached to it all right so for example if uh i if i did not want to mask a certain thing all right i can click on the mask let's say for the photo filter I can select a brush, all right? And I can say, okay, uh, let me make it a little bit uh, lighter, or I mean a little bit larger here. I'm just gonna do it very, very roughly, all right? And I can say, okay, I want to mask out, you know, the, the soldier, or I don't want, I don't want the effect of the photo filter all right because if you notice i am in the photo filter layer all right and that's where i'm drawing on that mask so if i don't want that photo filter um affecting that layer all right i am going to apply my mask there okay but if i say okay well this particular uh, uh, effect is created by two different layers. So the combination of two layers creates the overall effect. And if I don't want the overall effect uh, targeting, let's say, uh, you know, targeting the, uh, the white building, for example, okay, well, I can go ahead and mask it out from the first layer, all right? So I can go to my brightness um, uh, a contrast layer and I can mask out the white building. And then I have to replicate that over on the photo filter uh, mask. And so what I'm doing is I'm masking twice. No, that doesn't make sense. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the parent mask which is for the group. And I can say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and mask out just the building. All right. And again, I'm being rough just for, you know, uh, sake of, of speed on demonstration. All right. And now what I've done is I've told Photoshop that I don't want that cinematic blue effect uh um targeting any part of this building so i'm going to mask the building out and of course you're gonna take time with your mask and all that okay so now we have 
you can think of think of this kind of like your master layer all right uh your master mask all right which takes care of everything underneath and then below that you have sub masks that target very specific areas for that one particular layer all right does that make sense for you bill yes okay so that would be that would be a sub layer in this case um it's not it's not a term that's used very often i i have heard it before that's why it kind of rang a bell in me um but yeah so so this is this is what it is okay now because these are individual layers that get created you have of course all the power to modify it as needed all right so if you say okay well you know uh i have this um uh photo filter that's adding this blue mood let's say i don't want the blue mood let's want let's say i want you know uh a, a different blue or let's say i want an orange uh look to it okay you can go in and you can change that particular layer or all the layers if you want okay so maybe we want to make it a little bit brighter uh and you know maybe reduce the contrast whatever it is that you want to change you you are more than welcome to go in and change the individual parts okay and of course you can collapse your layer and there is your preset that has been augmented to your particular needs here's the caveat and i'm thinking again it's pr probably temporary i made changes to that preset i cannot save the changes to the preset and i can't create new presets based on these modifications all right so all those presets that are available here all right let me pull this back out all these adjustments and these presets that's it that's what you're stuck with all right so if i needed to regenerate this i it's not like it can come back to the blue mood all right and do it over and and have those changes saved you can see it generated a new set of uh layers with that oops with that um uh blue mood setting okay all right so let's see let's get rid of that one all right any questions on the adjustment presets yes i have a good one yeah <laughs> i can't find mine in, in uh, photoshop yeah. i opened it up and you were talking and then when i i see an adjustments tab and then i see all the uh things that you have there is a it just it says add an adjustment but it doesn't because i i never set this up is that maybe what i've done wrong uh um which version of uh photoshop do you have do you know uh, uh if if you go to if you go to help about photoshop yeah. all right it should be the 24.5 release all right 23 or 24 24. oh so i'm behind version okay okay so yeah so just go to your um creative oh, cloud account and do an update and and you'll you'll get all the the updates okay okay <clears throat> all right all right uh and of course if you don't subscribe to the creative cloud and you have an older version everything i'm saying is moot <laughs> doesn't matter <laughs> all right any other questions about uh, uh, the adjustments preset? Okay. Like I said, you know, uh, 
for me, yeah, it's a worthless uh, tool. Maybe down the road when I can create my own and save my own, it'll be more useful. But overall, this this is nothing. That's nothing for me. All right. So Sometimes it goes away. Like right now, I am on a picture and I have the context, con, yeah, you contextual. Know, yep. Contextual. And uh, I went to a, uh, I went to click adjustment layer. I, I clicked curves. Right? It was in the adjustment panel. I clicked curves and it went away. Yep. And when I go up into Windows, it's check mark. It but is it's not there. Yeah. Again, it's contextual. Uh, from here, all, all your uh, uh, modifications are done with this window. All right. Okay. Uh, and it's not like you have multiple selections available to you. So it's going to hide it automatically. That's uh, what confused me. Too. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing contextual about this particular step. All right. You can only do one thing at this point. So there's no there's no reason to have a bar with just one thing. You know? Right. It's it's only when you have multiple choices that it gives you that taskbar to uh, allow you to make uh, in theory it's designed to allow you to make the next decision out of several a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Whether that is achieved, it's still to be determined. Um, it, it's almost like the uh, right uh, right click in software where yes something and it, okay very much it. yes yes, but obviously this goes a little bit more into it because uh, each one of these may have its own little right click kind of thing, so. Um, yeah, again, you know, you have to wonder what is in the developer's heads at any given time. I like to give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt and saying that this is in preparation to something else that's going to come out down the pipeline that this will make better sense. That's, you know, well, I think having been a software developer that's what it sounds like to me it's like mm -hmm. okay this is what we're doing with this version release we'll bang it out this is what we'll do with the next version release right and instead of doing a, a a gallon of milk and maybe it all turns out wrong you do things and and step yes so what do they call it now in project management they call it agile where you do a piece of software that's independent of something else for the mm. process so maybe that's their thinking it's like okay let's install this yeah Next yeah time around, we'll answer it. yeah and and on top of that you know we have to keep in mind that behind the architecture that we're seeing uh is not only the legacy tools that we're familiar with but there's also all the new tools that rely on the Adobe AI that is, is still groundbreaking and new territory. So, for example, if we look backwards in history to some of these tools, all right, um, <clears throat> a lot of these tools were developed with a particular task in mind. And then some very creative people along the way said, you know what? Yeah, it works for that. But have you ever tried doing this with it? And then people are like, I never realized. All right. So the end users tend to really push the boundaries of some of these tools. But when it comes to AI, because it's so new, uh, it's just being developed. It's still in that that test stage. So I can imagine they don't want to get too far where a tool gets used in a way they didn't intend and it causes some serious trouble. And now they have to reverse engineer uh, 
how to fix that problem. You know, when they're first rolling out little bits, it's easier to track. If they were you know to this, you know what this sounds like instead of doing a full blown data version, they're probably thinking, okay, let's just release it in small pieces and see how it works. Yeah, Everybody but tests it. But there is a beta version available that you can download. I think I touched on this. Yeah. Um, beta version uh, obviously has its um, its good points and its bad points. All right, it's got its challenges. Beta versions obviously is not ready for prime time viewing. It's not ready for the everyday uh, um, consumer. It's a lot of uh, things that they're going to be implementing that are still in the developmental stage. They may have little bugs in them. They may have little flaws. Uh, it may not be fully configured uh, to work with the UI. All right. Or they may say, we're going to put it here. We're going to test it. And then we may say, you know what, instead of putting it here, it fits better over here. We'll switch it here. All right. So they get all this feedback from the beta testers. And of course, because it's it's not a, uh, what's the term? Um, Robust? No, 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 no. It, it's not um, uh, where it's tried and tested and they got all the bugs out of it. Um, not stationary. Um, oh, what's the term? Uh, well, anyway. Um, <clears throat> Be, because there are things that can go wrong with it, uh, you're kind of taking a little risk. The liability is on you as the user, as a tester, that if something does happen really bad, Adobe says, hey, you know, we warned you, it's, it's beta. There are things that can go wrong, all right? Um, so, you know, there's always that. But there are plenty of people out there that are uh, testing the beta versions. And of course, the biggest thing is the um, uh, gener generative fill um, uh, use of the AI where you're taking your canvas and you're adding, you know, X amount of space to it that there's absolutely nothing there, but you can uh, contextually add based on your, your existing image, all right? So like, for example, if I were to take this image and add to the side, the AI would analyze the image and say, well, there's two trees on the side. I will just expand on the trees and maybe add, you know, uh, a little bit more of the building uh, and maybe a you know a park bench or whatever it decides it needs to extend that image sideways. Okay, uh, and then of course you can go in and you can say, okay, I want a a, a little dog here. I want a, uh, oh I want a person uh, walking the dog, and then you just kind of like uh, make a little outline with your selection tool and how we have you know, context fill already in place. The beta will have you where you can type in what you want to insert into that space. All right, so you can make a little selection up here and you say, I wanna put, you know, uh, I, I wanna put a, um, all right, so you make a, a little selection, all right, and you say, okay, I wanna put a, an airplane all right, and you type in, you know, 747, and it'll fill that space with a 747 airliner, okay, photorealistic. Of course, mm -hmm. oops, of course, the, uh, the generative AI, uh, if you're familiar with like Mid Journey and Dolly, it's not 100% perfect. There's a lot of flaws to it, but uh, it's coming down the pipeline. It'll be here sooner than later. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you're interested in that kind of thing, Adobe rolled out 
uh, Adobe Firefly, which is their version of uh, text to image generator, where you type in what it is that you want and it will generate an image. Uh, right now it's you know being tested and, and it's gonna be coming out, rolling out prime time. So right now everything's kind of watermarked with the Adobe logo and all nine yards, but you can test it out. Uh, and for good or for bad, it was trained on Adobe stock submissions. So you're gonna see that certain things it does really, really well and other things it just fails miserably, okay? Um, but anyway, that's gonna be integrated into our tools down the road and, and probably sooner than later, you're gonna see it in the, um, the main version of Photoshop, okay? All right. Okay, uh, this uh, next one, let's see, can we change, go to, uh, we'll go to this one here, all right. <clears throat> the next tool I want to um, uh, showcase is the gradient tool, all right, the gradient tool. All right, so if you're familiar with the gradient tools in, you know, that are used for masking, in Lightroom, you know that you, you click and drag and you can expand the width of, of the uh, gradient. You can change the angle of the gradient, all that good stuff. In Photoshop, you can do that, but you have to do it in Adobe Camera Raw, all right? Which of course doesn't, does not get brought into Lightroom unless you're doing a smart object, okay? The legacy version of, um, actually, let me go ahead and create a new layer here. The legacy version of uh, the gradient tool, um, if you remember, <clears throat> you placed the cursor in one, sp in one spot, you dragged it to a new spot, and it would build the gradient all the way across and if you got it wrong, you had to do control Z, try again, control Z, try again, until you got something that you liked. Well, the new gradient tool uh, gets rid of that and makes it interactive. So now we can take, just like before, we can click and drag, okay? But whereas previously, it would place the gradient and then that's it. You're stuck with it. Now, what you see is we have something that kind of sort of resembles a little bit in a way of what we're used to seeing in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw, where we have certain points, okay? So we have our start point, we have our end point, all right? And of course, we have our midpoint, which in this case, we can offset, all right? So unlike Lightroom, uh, where we cannot have offset it, we can offset it here. And because it is a gradient, we can also add additional points anywhere along this line to create different colors. So color two, we can put color three, you know, and color four, all right, all anywhere along that line and we can adjust it, all right? So this new tool now allows us to edit live our gradient, all right? Which is something that we could not do before. I can move my center point, okay? I can double tap on the end and I can change the color, all right? So if you don't like the color, we can say, okay, we're gonna, you know, go blue to purple, whatever, whatever the case is, all right? So we have full editing capabilities. We can, we can add, all right, we can, just like previously, we can go up to the 
uh, our uh, context bar at the top, our toolbar. All right. Click on that. All right. Oh, wait a minute. We can double click. Here it is. Double click on, on, on the uh, layer. And we can double click and change anything along. We can add additional colors. All right. So maybe we want to change that to a totally different color. Okay. We can add opacity. So just like before, we can, you know, um, uh, make it go from 100% to 0% or whatever the case is. All right. So you have full control over it. All right. And then once you have it, here you go. Uh, I can adjust where my transitions for these colors are going to go. The midpoints between each color. All this is editable live, which is something that was not able to be done previously. If you needed to make a change, you had to scrap the old one, create a new one, hope you got it right, and then move forward. All right. So now let's say you're you're two hours into an edit and you say, oh, you know what? I need to change those colors on a gradient. Very simple. You just come back to it and you can uh, at any point make a, a modification. Okay. All right. And of course, we have the linear gradient. We have the uh, circular gradient. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, um, a conical gradient uh, and inverse horizontal gradient. Okay. And uh, the square gradient. Okay. Uh, typically, the ones I'll be using is either the linear or the circular gradient. Those are the two most common ones that are used. Okay. All right. So how can we use these? Let me go ahead and delete that. All right. Let's say I want to um, change my sky. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and make a uh, selection. Uh, color range and uh, I did it previously so it's already selected okay um, make my fuzziness uh, right about there okay maybe a little bit more all right I make my selection all right I now can go ahead and uh, go to my gradient tool, all right, and I can go ahead and drag down. It remembered what I used last time. All right, so <clears throat> right here, it's worth the money because uh, before I could do this previously, I would have to make sure that I had the correct gradient that I wanted to use selected ahead of time before I even applied this effect. Here, I don't have to worry about it, okay? Uh, of course, here we are um, utilizing it uh, within a mask, all right? So now I can just uh, double tap right on my layer icon, and it's gonna bring up my gradient fill. I click on my gradient and I am now able to edit it so I can get rid of those those points. And you'll notice that it's going to update live so you can see exactly what you're doing. All right. So I don't want let's say I don't want that purple. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I click on on that color icon there. And now with this one, I can edit my color and I say, okay, I want, you know, a more of a sky blue. All right. There, there we go. Okay. And maybe this blue, I want to edit it, maybe brighten it up just to, just a touch. Okay. And say, okay, hit okay. And I now have a, 
uh, a new sky. Okay, just like that. Okay, and if I want, I can even change the um, maybe change it to soft light. Let's see, linear light, overlay, soft, change it to overlay. All right, make it a little bit more natural. Okay, and just like that, I've added color to an otherwise bland sky. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of course, you can use it to create, um, you know, little spotlights. Uh, if you want to do something like change uh, day to night, you can create uh, little spots of light that you use to light your scene with. You know, maybe there's a couple of uh, outdoor lights. You put lights into it. You're going to use the circular gradient for those. All right. So the sky's the limit on the gradients. And of course, you can edit it on the fly. All right, any questions on live gradients? All right. Uh, again, it's not a major change. I mean, the tool has always been there. I just think that they made it a little easier to use. All right. It's now a non destructive way of working with gradients. And it's been a long time coming. All right. That has been one of my frustrations in the past. All right. One more tool to go through, and then uh, we'll go through some questions. All right. <clears throat> the last tool, all right, is the remove tool. Remove tool. Okay. And that comes in with the... Um, with the spot healing, the healing brush, the patch tool, all right? The remove tool is the one that looks like a band-aid with the two little stars, all right? The remove tool, okay? And there's a few differences between that and the spot healing tool, although they kind of sort of look on the surface like they do the same thing, okay? Well, let's, let's start off first with the spot healing, okay? Uh, as you can see, all right, uh, I am purposely showing this image because look at all those sensor spots. That is horrific. Horrific. All right, so whenever we come across something like this, we know that, ah, uh, you know, I got to get rid of all those spots. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go uh, to your spot healing brush. All right, because it's designed for, oh, and of course, it's not going to, ah, my brush is, is not working. Okay. And you just, typically, the way I do the spot is I'll just make my brush a little bit larger, and I'll just go over and click and click and click. All right. And it does a fairly decent job of getting rid of those spots. Okay. So for that purpose, fan friggin tastic. All right. I don't have to be uh, overly embarrassed by having all these sensor spots on my uh, image. Okay. But when it comes to removing items, this is where uh, sometimes the spot healing brush kind of fails all right so let me uh let me zoom in a little bit more here all right to these wires okay so if you are a landscape photographer you know that electrical wires are a bane all right if you're doing any kind of outdoor portraiture and you got a nice background, that background can be just made gross and disgusting just by all the wires that are, are coming from telephone poles and you just want to get rid of them. Okay. So what we can do is we can take our spot healing brush. All right. And typically, oops, uh, control Z. All right, we can go ahead and just draw right on it and 
hope that it does a decent job. Uh, but I don't know if you guys can see it. Let me zoom in here. All right. But it kind of didn't do a very good job. There is an artifacting going on from that tool. You can actually see where it removed the wire. And it made a kind of valiant attempt at removing it. Okay. Let's try this one here. Okay. Terrible, terrible job. All right. And of course, if we do something over like this where we have some texture, okay, that one didn't do too bad, okay. But for some reason, oh, there, it didn't even remove it. Oh, it's not even removing it here for some reason. It's just making this gross uh, mess, okay. I sometimes, I sometimes have a problem with spot alien brush, especially if I make the brush too big, where it brings in elements. Al yes, from from God knows where it's yeah. pulling it. And it's like, it's so frustrating. Absolutely. All right, so let me undo all that. Okay. And uh, you're going to love the remove tool. All right, Gloria, remember that photo with the pumpkin? That you yeah. sent me way back when, and we tried to remove it in, in Lightroom, and Lightroom failed miserably. And then yeah. we brought it into Photoshop, and, and we were able to do it in Photoshop, but it took some work. Yes. Guess what? This tool right here is going to make your life so much easier. Watch this. All right. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me size this down. All right. Now, the trick to any kind of content aware anything where either you're trying to fill it in with content aware or you're sampling from other sources in order to hide something like this in this case you want to make sure that your selection overlaps outside of what you're trying to to erase or hide or you know heal uh by a little bit okay this allows the AI to understand that, all right, the selection is in the center here, all right, but because the selection expands outward, it's going to sample that area outside. So, for example, uh, like with, with this one where we got the, um, the lines, the power lines, you notice that the power lines... Uh, the sun is hitting them, so a lot of them are a little bit brighter than the surrounding, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to notice that there is a definite something there that doesn't belong, right? One of these things does not look like the other. So it's going to recognize that there's that power line going, you know, across there, right? But it needs to know what am I going to sample from? So by expanding your selection to include some of the area around it it says oh i am recognizing foliage along that outer edge of the of the sample selection all right and i see that that bit of greenery that is within the sample selection also extends past my selection so I'm going to use that as a guide to fill in what doesn't belong here. And in this case, it's the wires. Make sense? All right. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, you don't want to make it, you don't want to make your brush the, the width of whatever you're removing. All right. Again, give it a little bit of room. All right. And what we're going to do is we're just going to paint here. All right. And you can see that it, it kind of gives you that that uh purple overlay mask all right so that way you know what it is that you're painting okay and as soon as you let go all right it's going to do a little bit of thinking and it's going to content aware fill that area now compare actually you know what let me switch tools all right now actually let me do this section here okay all right, 
Now I'm going to switch tools. And I'm going to go to the spot heel. I'm going to do this one here with the spot heel so you can see the difference. Okay. Spot heel, it removed the line. It removed the line. It did its job, but you can see it did it horribly, horribly. You can see uh, a ghost, a residue. Uh, it doesn't quite line up, right? But right next to it, where it took care of that other part of the line, that uh, um, remove tool did a beautiful job, okay? All right, so let me undo that. Uh, we will switch back to our remove tool. Okay. And I'll go ahead and just paint on that. Okay. And remove. Okay. So you can see it does a, a much better job. All right. All right. So let's break it down uh, a little bit. Okay. Because... If we look up, up at the top, we have some things available to us, okay? Uh, the first one is, well, the first one is the size. So you can, obviously, you can size it here, all right? Um, or you can use the Alt or Option. If you press and hold the Alt or Option and use your uh, uh left mouse button all right you can you can change the size on the fly i don't know if you know that trick okay but you gotta press and hold the alt uh or option key okay and then you can go ahead all right so you can you can change the size on the fly or as always you can use the the bracket keys all right uh right bracket expands left bracket makes it smaller all right, so you guys know that. All right, oops. The next one here is a little target with a pencil. Uh, if you have that selected, it will use the pressure sensitivity of a stylus. So if you use a stylus, it will use pressure sensitivity for the size. I'm not a big fan of it because, you know, uh i don't want the size shifting and changing while i'm drawing i don't want to be bothered with that so i usually i leave that unselected all right the next one is sample all layers all right and you can see i am checked sample all layers okay so what does this mean all right now, if you noticed previously, when I first started this, I got rid of all those little sensor spots. Okay. I am very confident in the tool to effectively re remove all those sensor spots without me having to do it on a separate layer. So what happens now, whenever I do anything, if you notice, I am still on my master layer here. So this tool is actually working destructively. Every change I make with that tool is modifying the pictures on the original layer. It's working destructively, okay? So I have to be aware of that. And if I see it do something that I do not like, I have the option of undoing it with the control Z, okay? But I have to do it at that moment. I can't wait down the line. If you're not comfortable working that way, and I honestly, I suggest you don't work that way, all right? Uh, certain things I do, all right? Like those spot removals, I'll do it, all right? Getting rid of these, these um, uh, power lines, I'll do it destructively. But whenever I'm doing something like high-end retouching on somebody's face, I will work in a different way. So what I'll do is I will come down to the bottom. I will create a new blank layer. Okay. And I will do my spot removal on the blank layer. 
But in order for that to happen, you have to make sure that sample all layers is selected. All right, so if I uncheck that and I am here on my blank layer, if I try to do anything, it's going to give me a warning saying, hey, I'm not finding any pixels here to manipulate because I'm in a blank layer, okay? So be aware with that, all right? So we get rid of that. We click on sample all layers. Now I can go and I can well, go ahead and remove, 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 and remove, okay? But because I am on this layer here, okay, if I hide it, you can see there are my lines, okay? So that means at any time, I can come back and fix it by saying, okay, well, you know, uh, I didn't mean to remove such a thing. I can go get my eraser tool, all right? And I can go ahead and just erase a certain part from that layer, okay? And I am back in business, all right? And I can do this, you know, uh, two hours down the road. It's, oh man, I don't know why I erased that. I actually need it. I can come back to this layer and bring it back. I don't have to panic as much, okay? It all depends on your comfort level and how you work. For me, power lines, I want them gone. I don't care. They're never coming back. I don't want them. I will do it right on right on the layer, okay? All right. Now, there are problems with this, okay? You got to understand that it is using artificial intelligence to analyze the scene around what it is you're trying to remove, all right? So like for example, here, let me zoom out, okay? Beautiful scene, but look at that big, bright yellow target right in the middle. Ah, that's disgusting. I want that sign gone, all right? So if I just zoom in here, okay, I grab my, um, I grab my uh, remove tool, okay? And I say, okay, I want to remove this. Now, if you're working with a mouse, this can be a little challenging because now I have to hold down the mouse button in order to activate the mouse, right? And you say, oh, I, I need to reposition my mouse in order to finish the rest of the selection. I ran out of desk space or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you say, oh, I, I got I to gotta let go of the mouse button, all right? But I wasn't finished with my selection, all right? So, I'll, well, in this case, it's not that big a deal. I'll just got to come back. And of course, the edges are horrendous. So I got to make sure that I come back and I get it all. So that can be a little kind of challenging. All right, so that brings us to our next uh, little check mark. All right, remove after each stroke. All right, so that means whenever you make a stroke, it doesn't matter if it's a short stroke or a long stroke, when you make a stroke, it's going to apply the effect. Okay, so let me bring that sign back. Okay. So now if I disengage that, if I uncheck it, I can say, okay, I am going to go ahead and start painting. All right. And I can get, I can get all the top part of the sign, but I ran out of desk space with my mouse. All right. I have to let go. All right. So now I can let go of everything. It's not going to apply it. All right, because I have that remove after each each stroke, right? 
So I can now come in and do the second part and the third part and however many parts, okay? I don't suggest you go too, too crazy and doing like, you know, like this sign and all the power lines and maybe a bird and the sensor spots, you know, getting all those marked and then hitting the OK button. OK, I don't recommend doing that work, work in little bits and pieces. OK, so now after you make your selection, all you got to do is like any of the other uh, requirements, you just hit the uh, the check. All right. Uh, or you can hit the enter key, I believe, and it will do the action. OK, so for little spots, you know, you can you can keep this on because it, it really does facilitate things. All right. So you can, you know, again, with, you know, like the power lines, you can say, okay, I'm going to do this section here. All right. Did a good job. I can do that section there. I can do that section there. Right. So you can do it and work in small stages to remove, you know, different things. All right. And it will do the job really, really nicely. Okay. All right. But if you need, if you need a little bit more leverage for your uh, masking, uh, you know, uncheck it, and it will wait for you to actually hit the check mark. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. All right. So. All right, so these are fairly simple, uh, pretty straightforward types of removals that you'll do on a general basis, okay? But what can it do, all right? It says, okay, like here, we have this log here. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of unsightly, all right? So again, I want to make sure that I uncheck this because I want to be able to Make sure I have everything selected, all right? And again, you don't have to be very, very concise with your mask. Uh, again, you want to kind of overlap a little bit outside of the mask so the AI tool understands what it is you're sampling from, okay? You also do not want to leave any holidays inside the mask because it'll it'll kind of like try to retain that and build something around what's left. So, you know, be aware of what it is you're masking and make sure you make your, your mask selection appropriate. Once you make it, go to the top, all right, and hit the check mark or hit the enter key, all right? It's probably faster to just mask, 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 Hit the enter key, it'll do it. Mask, mask, mask. Hit the enter key, it'll do it. All right. So just like that, you can remove some unsightly elements from your uh, image. And you can see it does a really, really decent job with, you know, um, stuff like this. Okay. Now, a lot of you might think, well, you know, uh, why do I need to get rid of that stuff? All right. This goes back to you want to show you, you want to show only the things you want your viewer to see in your photographs. If there are elements that distract the viewer's eye, that works against you. So you want to minimize any of these distractions. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's the way it is in reality. There was, you know, there was that log there. By removing it, I'm creating a false narrative. Okay, I understand that, but you have to understand, are you taking a photo for a newspaper that needs to understand that there is a log in the river that's being jammed up against a war waterfall? Probably not. If you're not doing journalistic work, you don't need that journalistic integrity. All right. 
by removing something out of sight, first of all, it's a temporary thing. That floating log may not be there next year. So removing it isn't going to, uh, you know, de-authenticate the, the image whatsoever. All right. But it will make it a lot more pleasant to your viewer. It's also going to make it less distracting to your viewer. All right. So keep that in mind. There are things that you do have authority to remove. And so, for example, if you're if you're editing a portrait. All right. What's the number one rule? If the blemish is temporary, you remove it. All right, because what's going to happen now that that beautiful portrait you, that you took has all these blemishes that in a month are no longer on the person. Their skin cleared up. That big pimple that was on their cheek is gone now. So what's going to happen? That photograph is going to be a reminder of a horrific thing in their psyche i hated that friggin pimple and now i gotta look at this stupid portrait that always reminds me i had that pimple on my face and they're gonna hate the picture they're gonna want it gone they're gonna take it off the wall and and hide it and you failed as a photographer all right so temporary things get rid of them logs on a river very temporary get rid of them Okay. All right. So, uh, any questions on that tool so far? You can see the benefits of removing those, those, um, here, I'll show you with the power lines without. All right. With that sign in front without, with the, the clutter on the, uh, the edge of the, the waterfall and without see how much cleaner that looks no distractions and it does not change the spirit of the of the image it's about the church okay it's about the church it's not about the garbage floating in the river it's not about that ugly sign in the front okay how many times have you taken a photograph of a location, brought it back home, opened it up and go, oh my God, I never saw that sign. And here it is, plain as day, in the photograph. It happens all the time. We are blind to certain things. Let your edit reflect that, what happens naturally in our own minds. We mentally erase things. We mentally erase power lines all the time. We mentally erase signs all the time. Okay. So anyway, that's my little soapbox on that. Okay. Let's give it a, something a little bit more challenging. Oops. Let's bring this and put this back. Okay. All right. Ah. Uh. I don't want that person and that dog there. Let's remove the person and the dog. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do, well, first of all, let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit more. Okay. We're going to make our brush larger. All right. So holding down the alt key or the option key, and then uh, click and drag your, your mouse. If you, if you, click and drag your mouse to the right, it's going to make it bigger. If you click and drag to the left, it's going to make it smaller. Okay. All right. So that's a, that's a good way of kind of, kind of doing it. All right. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to paint. And because it's a large kind of like really weird section, you want to make sure that remove after each stroke is unchecked. All right. That way it'll allow you to make your selection. All right. And there's my guy. I'm going to remove the dog. All right. And I'm going to, let's resize the, 
brush. Okay, get the, the dog's legs. Oh, let's resize down a little bit smaller. We'll get rid of the leash as well. We can't forget the leash. All right, and you know what? Since we're here, we have the shadows too. Maybe, maybe we should get rid of the shadows because obviously if we remove the, the dog and the dog walker, but leave the shadow, it's going to look strange just, you know, having shadows on the ground. All right, so we'll get rid of that. All right, and of course the shadow from the leash, we'll get rid of that too. All right, ready? Let's go. We hit OK. We give it a few minutes. You can see the... And there it did. It did a fantastic job, didn't it? Woohoo! Oh, maybe not. Let's take a look. All right. It tried to replicate the uh, defense. It kind of did a decent job considering, you know, it's... It's machine learning trying to to figure out what is actually behind a person. Let's check out the uh, oh, what the heck's going on here with the paving stones? All right, well it got rid of the shadow. Oh look at that! Did an awesome job removing the shadow, but it scrambled up all the paving stones. Okay, so you can see that. Uh, there are a lot of limitations to this tool. Obviously, it can handle certain things really, really easily. Other things, not so much. The more complex something is that it's trying to fill it in with, the more it's going to fail. All right. The larger the space is that you're trying to fill in, the more it's going to fail. So you have to be mindful of that, all right? And obviously, you have to be mindful on the time that you took the picture. If you don't want the guy there, wait till he's gone and then take the photograph, all right? Don't say to yourself, ah, I'll remove him later in Photoshop because you can see it's just, it's not going to happen the way you think it will, all right? However, this tool does some things fairly decently, all right, that I found, all right. So, for example, uh, if you notice here, uh, we got a broken line, okay. Uh, if a uh, missing line here, and um, it's also got, you know, this line here, I have a feeling, let's see, I have a feeling this one was added, all right? Uh, this one here may have been there a little bit, all right? Because if we look, it, it almost looks like it connects to here, right? Okay. So what we can do is, like, for example, uh, this right here. It's broken. It's misaligned, all right? Let's see if we can do anything with that. I'm going to size down a little bit and I'm going to go ahead and select that and I'm going to select all the way to the end and hit OK. All right. Notice how it aligned it, right? It, it did a decent job aligning it. It failed here, okay, but maybe if we just extend it a little bit further hit okay a little bit further hit okay yeah no maybe not maybe make it a little bit of a, yeah it's not it's not going to do it okay so uh it can fix certain things all right so let's get rid of that okay let's see will it do this one Will it fit, fill that in? Oh, there you go. Did a better job filling that in. Okay. So we can use it to kind of fix certain things that are created when we 
remove something and it, it doesn't matter what tool you use to remove all right you you obviously you're going to pick the right tool for the right job obviously it failed miserably here we would need to try something else maybe clone stamp tool maybe you know uh, uh taking a patch out of a separate frame and dropping it into this frame whatever it is all right but whenever there's little problem areas this tool can kind of sort of help correct it all right so let's see maybe we want to totally get rid of this one all right yeah all right and then uh we have this line here that kind of dips down and then back up all right let's see if maybe it'll fix that oops uh, let's see if we can get it a little bit straighter it entered look at that beautiful beautiful job okay so uh this tool has a lot going for it but as you can see it also has uh, a long way to go to um, really be um, useful in certain effects all right but again i pushed it here i i really pushed it by trying to remove an entire person from my scene okay all right uh so that's all the tools the um contextual toolbar at the bottom the adjustment presets which i think is you know stupid live gradients which is awesome finally and of course the remove tool okay any questions no questions okay so hopefully uh you know uh this will open up some new avenues for you uh another tool to put in your toolbox for for video uh, for uh image editing so you know doc i i have an observation back when you guys were talking about where they might be going with the way they're doing these tools yep and and uh, one of the things I've been doing a little bit of uh, is playing around with. Well, I've been shooting with RAW on my camera, and then uh, am I on camera? Uh, anyway, I've been shooting RAW on my camera and processing it with Lightroom on my camera. Yeah, and then sometimes I'll bring it over into Lightroom. So I've been practicing and playing around with, you know, Lightroom on the phone. Oh, light. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I do that, you know, the thought I had when I went into Photoshop, which I hadn't been in a while, actually, uh, it occurred to me that maybe, you know, that some of that stuff looks like they're trying to make it more Lightroom like, and that maybe then, you know, going to start, we're going to start seeing some more Photoshoppy things. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, actually, the the first clue actually came several years back when they revamped the Adobe Camera Raw system to look more at, at the, the current version looks more like Lightroom Mobile than the, than the original Camera Raw, okay? So yes, they are moving to a more uh, um, homogenized look uh they're definitely working at integrating you know these two systems because they they really do work well together now as it is um but as they start extending into mobile platforms they want everything to really just move together nicely all right that's why you know things like uh uh, Lightroom Mobile and uh, Lightroom and Lightroom for the web, they all rely on your Creative Cloud account in order to uh, to create the um, um, the libraries there and to store the images there. All right, simply because they understand that you're limited for space on these things. Okay, you're not going to be storing, you know, uh, all your edits on this. All right. And then how do you get from here to the desktop easily enough? 
And that's, of course, where the creative cloud comes into play. Uh, by being able to upload to the cloud from here, and then on the desktop, you download from the cloud with all the settings that you applied here intact. You know, and then sharing it back. So yes. So far that's the case when I shoot Lightroom on my phone and then I go look at Lightroom on my computer, that's mm -hmm. all there with all the changes. Yep. Still what I haven't gotten to yet is how to get Lightroom and Lightroom Classic to talk to each other. And anyway, but it's been it's been interesting the the advancements that have come along yeah. with this, yeah. what you can do on a phone. <laughs> yes. And and the other thing I was thinking was like that last picture you were working on, you know, what the end, what the end result is, you know, if a lot of what I work on ends up on the web mm -hmm. and the size of it, like that picture there, you just need to get rid of that fuzzy spot in the middle and a couple of those unconnected pipes and. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and, or in another case, I was, Walking around Lowe's last week, waiting for my friend to buy some. I was taking took a bunch of pictures of the flowers with my practice in the raw and ran them through Lightroom real quick and you know did some things to them and yep. real quick I had yeah you know, a decent enough picture absolutely yeah and, you know I'm thinking well there must be someone who could you you know anyway so yeah 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 the monetary part starts thinking but it was pretty interesting from photo to you know product image, I think. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it, you're absolutely right. It makes sense. You have to uh, understand what the uh, end use is for any one of these images as to how far you need to go with the edit. You know, obviously, high end uh, retouching for like a family portrait you're not going to get away with what I did with that last image and and leaving things disconnected and and blurry looking and things like that. Um, but if it's something in the corner, way in the background, on an image that's going to be this big on a screen on a website, by all means, yeah, go for it. Uh, nobody will ever notice. Nobody will ever complain. Hey, speaking of small images and changing the subject a little bit, <laughs> okay. uh, when, <laughs> I'll let <laughs> you. Okay. We that uh, little thing you had out at the uh, we had out at the New Britain Museum. Yes, New Britain Museum of Art. Yep. And that uh, illusionist photographer had his exhibit in the other room. His name escapes me right uh, now. Um, Walter Wick. Walter Wick. Wick. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, they had a big spread about his. Uh, Exhibit up there in the uh, Sunday paper. Oh, nice! And and those who haven't paper. seen it, it's it's worth the. Uh, I would say it's worth the trip. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, I've never heard of that fellow before, but uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, Bill Bill was with me when we went to uh, see it uh, uh, as well. Um, so yeah, it's if if you haven't gone. It's amazing what this guy has done uh, with the set building for the I Spy books. It's just friggin' phenomenal. Some of the problem solving that he undertook in order to get some of those images um, was very interesting. <clears throat> now, uh, I've known about the I Spy books for a long time. I bought them for my kids way back in the day. And I always thought that they were amazing photographically, all right? Uh, but I never stopped and analyzed how he did it. It was like, yeah, this is, this is nice. I enjoy it for what it is. The book, here it is. Put it back on the shelf. Out of mind, out of sight, okay? Here it is. Many, many, many years later, I get involved in commercial photography. I'm problem solving on how to <clears throat> do certain things photographically. And after listening to his, his talk at the museum, it's like, wow, I use that same technique for some of my stuff. You know, I, I uh, figured it out the same way he did. 
and I, it, you know, it never occurred to me that, yeah, somebody had already figured it out ahead of me, but it's, it's the problem solving that goes into it. It just, it's amazing. And it's like, wow, we both came to the same exact conclusion and we both got the same exact results. It's amazing. So. Yeah, I liked about that guy. He seemed to sure have fun with doing what he was yes. doing. Yes, absolutely. And that seemed to be part of this problem solving. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right, you know. Brian, what newspaper do you see that in? Oh, the Connecticut Post, CT Post. Okay, oh. I'll find it. Cool. Yeah, he was a uh, Connecticut native for a long, long time. So that was a big, pretty big deal that we got to see him that night. Just yes. know who he was and we got to see him uh, give a nice talk. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, awesome. All right. Uh, anybody else got any questions on anything that I covered uh, with Photoshop today? No, that, that was helpful because I had trouble figuring out. Uh, okay. Um, you know, the, what I was talking about, the contextual uh, little box. And yeah. The, the, the only thing is, it looked as if on your screen, or maybe you have a newer version and not. I do a Photoshop. Uh, my version of Photoshop, did I put it away? Yeah. It comes in on the bottom with all the other tools that you miscellaneous kind of tools instead of up on top next to the spot healing tool. The remove tool comes in here. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. So here, I'll uh, I'll show you how to fix that. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the all right so i park i'm right-handed i park mine on the right-hand side um simply because it, it's it's easier for me to to access it going this way rather than crossing over make sense all right so uh if you go to all the way to the bottom you're going to see the three ellipses okay uh, if yeah, you, I, I, I was on mute. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you click on that, all right, the little side arrow, mm -hmm. uh, it'll on yours. It may give you additional tools. All right. Uh, but it, somewhere along there, uh, it will also say edit toolbar. Okay. Um, the reason it says edit toolbar alone by itself is just before logging on, I, I switched it back to the default, All right? But if you click on that, it's going to bring up this dialog box that will allow you to customize your toolbar. So for example, for me, uh, we have the rectangular marquee and we have the elliptical marquee tool, right? But we also have this one where you can select a single row or a single column. Those for me, I never use. So I might just click and drag them from the left to the right. And now it removes it from your menu on the side. Okay. Just like with uh, the Microsoft Office. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. You can also reorder uh, uh, things. Okay, so like the magnetic lasso tool, I never used that. I could get rid of that. Uh, object selection, quick selection, magic wand. I'll keep those. Uh, crop, perspective, crop. I never use perspective crop. I use the perspective tool, but not the, and I never use the slice or the slice select. So I might, you know, want to just go ahead and remove those. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get rid of that one as well. The eyedropper I use, but the 3D material dropper, uh, eventually that's going to be gone. Photoshop is getting rid of any 3D association with Photoshop whatsoever. All right, the color sampler tool, eh, I don't usually use it. And the rare times I need it, I, I know where to find it. I never use the ruler. 
I never use the notes and I never use the count tool. So might as well get rid of it. I don't need it. I don't use it. Uh, why have it clutter? Okay. Spot healing. All right. And here is the remove tool. All right. Um, again, if you don't see it, you know, look on where it says extra tools, right? Which is the column on the right. All right. And that will probably be towards the bottom. Just click and drag it over from the right to the left and you're good to go. All right. Color replacement, mixer brush. Yeah. Sometimes you use that pencil. I don't use clone pattern. I never use. History, yeah. Uh, background eraser, no. Magic eraser, no, I never use that. All right, so, you know, uh, bucket tool, I don't use those. So you can go ahead and clean all of these up um, as you see fit, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, vertical type, horizontal type, uh, I don't. I don't use any of those. Direct selection, yeah, 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 yeah. The line tool, I never use. All right, the shape tool, I never use. Uh, polygon and triangle, I, I never use those either. All right, so um, rotate view, I never use. Zoom, okay. And then when you're done, just click on done and voila, okay. The other thing you can do while there. All right, and all right, so now they're they're gone. All right, so like for example, if we look here on the crop tool, you're gonna see that there is no little uh, triangle in the corner. All right, actually, let me switch to zoom. All right, see how the magic wand has a little triangle? Yeah. My crop tool does not. It's because there are no longer any tools, you know, within that one tool group. All right, I got rid of them all. So now when I select that, it's just the crop tool. But if I go above to the magic wand, if I click on that little side arrow, it's going to give me this little context menu. Okay. All right. Uh, but let's say, you know, on the off chance I need one of those tools, I still have access to it. I come down again to where the little ellipses are. You'll see that there's a little triangle, all right? If we click on, on that, on the little triangle, it's going to give me all those tools that are now in the extras column, all right? So here's that perspective crop tool, okay? So for the one in a millionth chance that I need that tool, I can get it here. All right, so it's not like it's not available to me, okay? I'll but put it back. If I, all right, so let's say I end up finding that I, I use them more often than I thought. Oh my God, I never realized. We go back to edit tool. We look for it right here. Here's our perspective crop tool. We take it and we're going to bring it right here and we're going to put it right with our crop tool, okay? Click on done. Now, when we look here, you'll see that little triangle is now on our crop tool, right? That means there are additional tools available, and there it is, perspective crop tool, okay? All right. The other thing you can do is uh, you can go back to edit toolbar, all right? And once you get it looking the way you want, okay, you can save as a preset. So you just go here, save preset. So for example, um, you know, I, I've said in the past that I use I use Photoshop not only just for photo editing, but I also do it for digital painting. All right, so you can have a one setup for photo editing and a separate setup for digital painting and you just load and unload as uh, needed, okay? Uh, but more than likely you're gonna be up here in the, um, in your setup tab, okay? So here we can reset duck setup and 
there it is. All right. All right. Um, that was a good question. Any other questions? All right. Cool beans. Uh, let's switch. Thank you once again for hanging out with me. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully I didn't fry too many brains this time. I, I, I don't think I did. Uh, this was fairly easy. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I, I got to balance that, you know, I, I got to make sure I don't, <laughs> I got to make sure I don't fry brains to the point that, you know, I, I, you end up in, in, uh, in the mental ward. Doc, you have to remember you're catching us at 6 30 at night after all. Yeah, while. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, long day work. I gotta. <laughs> now, Monday, Monday's my hiking day, and sometimes mm. by the time we get to 6 30, I'm like, eh. <laughs> In fact, I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't, drink, mm. I shouldn't drink coffee at this hour of night, but I have a cup of coffee here. <laughs> Uh, that explains it. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Um, next week is general Q and a, if anybody has an image, they would like me to edit for them and, and walk through the editing process as a great time to do it. Um, otherwise, you know, have your questions ready for me and, you know, maybe we'll, uh, do some problem solving, uh, answer some questions that you know problems you may be having and again it doesn't matter it does it, it it could be editing all right it could be something to do with camera something to do with lighting whatever it is okay cool. all right guys once again thank you so much i really appreciate you and hopefully we'll see you next week thanks Doug. all right thank you, Doug. be good watching learning photography with duck brought to you in association with milford photo your local full service camera store located in downtown milford connecticut milford photo offers you a personalized shopping experience from the latest camera gear to printing and framing services and of course educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography don't forget to tell them duck sent you